the conversation. We are pleased to welcome Philip, founder and principal of Philip Thomas Inc. Since establishing his own firm in 2011, Philip has worked with a wide range of clients on projects both in the United States and internationally. His work can be found in many of the top buildings in New York City, including the Dakota, 15 Central Park West, River House, and One Madison. His work has been featured in publications and interior design publications, including Architectural Design, El Decor, House Beautiful, The New York Times, and The Wall Street Journal. Join me in welcoming Philip. Hello, it's so good to be back. How are you? Great. So here we are for our second installment of Living Artfully, Creating Timeless You're, you're not sick of me yet? My goodness, I'm yeah. impressed. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I believe this is the fourth time overall you've collaborated with Skinner. Um, for those of those, uh, for those joining us that haven't participated in those pre previous conversations, uh, could you walk us through your creative process and um, how we kind of develop the schemes that we're going to walk people through here in a, in a little bit? So the first time I visited Skinner was uh, probably three years ago at this point, and Skinner let me loose in their warehouse up in Massachusetts. And if anything gets me excited, it's like the search for a treasure. And in a warehouse like that, there are so many treasures to be had. So um, I think they will no longer let me in the warehouse per se. Um, but I will say that during COVID, we've managed to, uh, to make the treasure hunt still as exciting. Dan will take me around on his phone and we do a Zoom and we review each and every piece. And sometimes we review it over again and over again, really just absorbing everything and doing it by video and by photograph, which there's not, you know, there's something to be said for seeing the piece in person, but it's incredible the technology these days that allows us to visit auction houses, not only in our hometowns, but around the world to bid on such exquisite pieces as the ones that you'll find in this auction. So thank you, Dan, for indulging me with that and allowing me to, to get inspired by a, by a technology. And so the way I, I, I just, I love being, I, inspiration, it, it may not come in the biggest piece that, that I find for a room, but it might come in the smallest piece, which then I build my rooms around that. So. For me, it's just about pieces that speak to me. Um, I don't necessarily have, I always like to, you know, for so many people, it's often daunting to see these people at auction and not understand how to use them in their interiors. So the reason why we're doing this discussion, this collaboration today is to show people how easily and seamlessly you can bring pieces from auction into your home. And for that reason, I like to kind of use my interiors as a reference point for the catalog to show just how easily they can go in your home. Um, and so when I start my, my treasure hunt with you guys, I don't have specific interiors in mind. Instead, I see these pieces, big or small, that speak to me. And then they remind me in many ways of feelings that I had when I was creating these, other, th these real interiors of mine. And I build from that. So, and that's the end result is what you see now. Great. Why don't we walk into scheme one, which uh, is a dining room. Uh, when we were talking earlier at the, at the beginning of the process, you said that dining rooms are often an underutilized space, uh, but it's also a great space for individuals to tell their story and share their passions. Um, if you could share some suggestions on how to incorporate items into a formal dining room that really reflect uh, a person's identity. You know, I think there's something to be said for collections. I think collections really are a reflection of an individual and their passions and whatnot. It's so often that I'll get a call from a client saying, Philip, find me a collection. And I say, that's not something that I can do, but it's a trip that you and I can, or a journey that you and I can take together to find those pieces that speak to you and mean something to you. For example, in the interior that you're seeing right now, um, in the far corner of this room, there's a whole vitrine filled with Venetian glass. And so when I saw some of these wonderful Venetian pieces that you have coming up in the auction, I immediately went back to that vitrine that I created specifically to show off these, these 
functional pieces of, of glass, but elevating them to works of art and elevating them to something that has meaning and not only has meaning for the people that live in the space, but for the people that visit the space. And, you know, functional pieces like candlesticks and vases shouldn't just be beautiful when they're being used, but should be beautiful when they're not being used. So there are objects like the Puy Forcat vases in the, in the coming auction, which is 11-11, um, mm. that I think are just as beautiful with or without flowers. So it's that craftsmanship, that artsmanship that you want to show in your pieces. And um, that brings just an elevated level of sophistication to, uh, to your table. So, so and the, in, in addition to the, uh, the Puy Facard, which are quintessential art deco, um, we also have the Hoffman chairs in this, and, and the table has a distinctly uh, Art Deco feel to it, too. My um, client has commented on those Hoffman chairs. Her text messages are coming up on my screen right now. So she loves them. And they are, I tell you, some of the most comfortable chairs you'll ever sit in. And I just think, for me, the, the Hoffman chairs were, that was a moment for me in my evolution as an interior designer where I learned about the Wiener Werkstatt and the Viennese secession movement and how you could take classical motifs and streamline them and interpret them and make them more contemporary. So to me, Hoffman has a very special place in my heart. Nice. So your next scheme uh, is a home, uh, home bar. I'm a big fan of the at-home bar area. So are a lot of people now that COVID is, uh, has changed the living dynamic. The yes. five cocktail is very important. Well, so I'm glad to hear that there's been a resurgence of your client, clients looking for uh, this type of area in their home. <laughs> um, so what's your, what's your staging process? What kind of items other than typical barware might you incorporate um, to make it kind of stand out from uh, the rest of the space? You know, for so many years, people used to hide their bars behind doors and kind of almost be a little bit ashamed about having kind of like barware. Uh, that's no more. People are now actually uh, bar rooms are becoming more prevalent and not just in basements, but in main living spaces and homes. And so you not only have to have the, you know, the requisite pieces like crystal and, and bottle openers and whatnot, but bring pieces that like a dining table show your character and bring interest sculptural pieces that um, distract almost from the functional pieces um, elevate to it make it it can be a bar but a display at the same time which I think is so important things that capture light and reflect light in different ways and excite the eye so that um, it has meaning not only at 5 p.m but at 5 a.m when you're getting up to get the kids ready for school nice nice I think probably the maybe the the feature lot in this particular scheme are these Hermes ice buckets. They're just incredible. I think that there are going to be a lot of people fighting over those at this auction because they are exquisite. I can test from the Zoom video that we did to for the treasure hunt that they are really beautiful pieces. But you know, it's it's important to have pieces with character in all your interiors. And while those are such elevated pieces, I even think the simple uh, wire face silhouette stools that you see in lot 1536, those are pieces that are not only functional, but almost are works of art in themselves, you know, yeah. large sculptures. So those bring a touch of character to any interior, even when they're not being used, which I think is so special. I think I, our next scheme is also a, uh is uh, the cozy corner, if you will, the library or the cozy corner. Um, great, great kind of decompressed space. Um, mm -hmm. I guess with, with the last year of, uh, you know, people have needed to develop an oasis within the house. Um, when designing a space like this, do you, do you start with the space or do you start with an object and then work around the object to fill the space? Well, you know, in this space in particular, for me, it's very important to have a division between the space in which you work and the space in which you relax, okay? And one of the big ways to get you to that point of relaxation is a comfortable chair. And, um, you know, some, in other spaces, it could be objet for me, but in this space, having a chair where the individual feels truly at peace and comfortable um, I can tell you that in the interior that we show you right here, 
this was probably like the 15th or 16th lounge chair that I sat my client in before they felt like they, you could see kind of their face just loosen up and they were like totally in another place. I almost thought they were going to fall asleep in the chair. So yes, chairs for your kind of like your, your escape rooms or whatnot, your, your man caves in, after COVID, it's really important to have a comfortable chair and then to surround you with things that bring you joy, bring you memories. I mean, I thought this snail, that coffee table, lot 1399, mm -hmm. was just a piece that was so exquisitely crafted, but also so whimsical at the same time and kind of a thought provoking piece <laughs> to have in your space. Much like the magazine rack, a lot, lot 1123, which you can help me with the artists and whatnot that make these pieces, but um, it almost doesn't need magazines to be beautiful. It, it just works and functions on its own. All of these pieces just creating such intense joy and such a layered sophistication to the space to really kind of make yeah, this, people dis disappear or travel. Yeah, in this case, the, the, the snail table is made by Federico Armijo, um, hand carved base with a glass top, but you're right, very whimsical, I guess for your, for your cozy corner, you want to slow down, you want to chill out, maybe the snail's a good metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I hadn't thought about that until just now. I just thought it was a cool piece to have around. The, um, uh, the, the magazine rack is a kind of classic American art deco by Fred Farr. Um, and the, the chair is a, um, uh, is a Rissom chair done later under license by Tucci. It's called the big chair. Um, it, it's great. Oversized, comfortable, big oversized ottoman. Uh, really it's like it embraces you almost, which I think is so important in a space like this is to really feel like protected. And then we have an approachable um, George Nakashima coffee table, which so many of his pieces of, are out of reach for many people. Um, if, you're, if you're looking for kind of that entry level piece into Nakashima furniture, this is a, this is a great, great place to start. And it still has the beautiful wood, which is so characteristic of Nakashima's work. Um, yeah. And... You know, it's such a simple form, but the wood and the grain pattern and whatnot just elevates it to that level. And that's what his is a signature of all his work. So, I, I, go go ahead. ahead. No, no, I was just going to say it's, you know, mixing those more organic elements with like the glass pieces, like the galet, vase, and um, is it a Vitozzi uh, bottle? I can't remember, but the simplicity and the sobriety of those pieces contrasted with the more organic. I like that juxtaposition. I like that tension. That's what I like to bring to all of my interiors is that kind of tension. There's yeah. no other, no better way to say it. <laughs> so I noticed here the space is neat and not too overcrowded. Um, uh, people can tend to um, collect things and it can almost start becoming borderline cluttered. How do you <laughs> advise your clients to you know, keep it to a minimum, um, you know, really for your, for their own <laughs> mental well-being, sometimes it's good to, to remove the clutter, you know. You know, like they say, when you go out at night, check yourself in the mirror and remove one thing. Um, that's much the same way I feel about an interior. When there's too much in a space, oh, yeah. it's almost hard to really appreciate all of those pieces because the chatter and the, of the visual clutter becomes so loud. So choose pieces that really bring you joy and even think about, you know, changing things for the seasons and whatnot or at, and giving new meaning and new sight lines to a space. That's what keeps the space feeling fresh and exciting. Um, and also, you know, it's interesting how, for example, this wonderful little radio lot number 1134, such a utilitarian piece, a vintage piece, but displayed properly in a very well curated interior, that piece is elevated itself to a piece of art, a piece of sculpture, not only in its form and function, but in its choice of materials and colors. It's just, it's a work of art. So next we're um, going to look at a kind of an open floor plan uh, dining area with uh, open floor plan and loft living uh, certainly becoming a trend. Um, 
how do you how do you ground such an open space? Um, do you do you use one large piece of design or a piece of furniture again and build out into the space, um, or or do you or do you start with um, you know say lighting for instance? That's a fabulous chandelier over the table. Uh, Isn't that a great piece? You know, there there's so many glass walls. You know, it's. It's a challenge. You need places for your eyes to settle within an open plan because your eyes could just drift everywhere. And that is a really big challenge with open plan place spaces is establishing zones within this large zone. And some people do it using carpets. Sometimes that's not an option. So in this instance, uh, in this interior, we found this incredible live edge dining table that was made uh, for the space and really kind of drew your attention to it. And then, you know, it is a dining room, but the, at the same time, it's not used as a dining room all day long. So giving it a purpose when it's not being used, like the one that we did here, where we displayed beautiful ceramics uh, from France from the 1950s and 60s with sculptural flowers on top, really gave it a purpose and really gave it something that could be appreciated day in and day out. And um, so that's what I think is really important about open plan is being able to give each space multiple meanings so that it stays fresh and it um, it stays relevant. That's what's important to me. And in this case, you picked um, a nice mix of kind of Scandinavian design, a little, um, uh, the table at the bottom is uh, the Edo table by Thomas Mosier. Thomas Mosier, uh, for those who are not aware, is um, a main furniture craftsman, started as uh, really a, a, a one-man uh, shop, grew to uh, employ a number of people up in um, New Gloucester, Maine, and then they moved in, actually started in Auburn, Maine, moved to New Gloucester. We're now getting into the second generation of Mosiers, and where the original designs were uh, very shaker inspired, um, kind of stripped down. Uh, the second generation is bringing designs like this that have a, an obvious uh, Japanese influence. Uh, they've got much more of kind of a Danish line. Uh, so certainly they're a, um, uh, a, a, good, a good source for, um, I, I would say boutique furniture almost, you know, there, uh, many of their pieces are made to order. Um, we have a number of Mojo pieces in the sale. It's great. The, you know, it's, go ahead. What's so remarkable about, to me about Moser is that it is something that's really been developed in recent decades, mm -hmm. but it's already become a collectible. And what's what, the reason why to me it's a collectible piece of furniture is because you truly see the hand that made the piece. And for me, uh, perfection is not achieved in creating a perfect plastic interior. For me, perfection is being able to see uh, the hand that executed it, the mind that realized or em envisioned the piece and brought it to reality. That to me is perfection. That to me is fascinating. And you see that with each one of the Moser pieces. So I see nothing but these pieces accruing greater and greater value over the years and decades to come. They're truly magnificent pieces that I use in my interiors because uh, of exactly that. You see the hand behind them. And it's a nice touch. Each piece is signed by the cabinet maker. Uh, you can go on their website and you can read the bios of the different, if, you know, if they're still with them. Um, so they, you, you do get a personal touch. The, and then, you know, when you, uh, kind of segueing by the hand that made them. In this case, you highlight with some um, mid-century studio pottery. Uh, we've got some Makato Yabe uh, tea bowls, lot 1429. Uh, Makato Yabe was a, a really a strong proponent and a champion of uh, Japanese ceramic techniques here in New England. Um, taught at many universities, private classes. Uh, so there are a lot of, uh, a lot of people in this region that are uh, Yabe fans. And the other two pieces come from the, uh, um, what was the final inventory of uh, Otto Heino. Otto and his wife Vivica were major drivers in the 
uh, studio pottery movement of the of the post-war period where um, you had a lot of uh, artistic people taking their their GI Bill checks and buying kilns and starting workshops and experimenting with glazes and um, so we we have a good number of pieces from from him as well and uh, they 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 bring a nice organic feel to the room I think you know there are a ton of lots in this auction with beautiful studio ceramics pieces and not only is it just the way the the piece is built or thrown. But as you said, it's the glazes. It's incredible when you mix one oxide with another oxide and you don't necessarily know what's gonna come of it. But what does come of it is something so exciting. And just, you never can predict what's gonna to happen to a piece when it's put into the kiln to be fired. How is one glaze going to melt quicker than the other? So I just think there's something so fascinating about ceramics and pottery. It's really, I probably sound like a loser, but I think they're very cool. <laughs> Pottery geek. Um, so in this room, you know, you've got lots of glass, lots of windows. The outside comes in. It's not always easy to bring that airiness to a room if you don't have that natural light. Um, what are some of the techniques you use where, uh, you know, f ceiling to floor glass walls aren't, aren't an option? You know? To me, uh, the way light is used, natural or artificial, is fascinating. You know, it's using different sheens, different textures that reflect light in different ways. You can be in a completely, you could be in a bunker for, 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 better, for a better example, with no natural light. But the, the materials that you choose can really create the illusion of light and depth and texture. So um, as many people can attest, I uh, am, you know, the higher the sheen, the better for me. Um, Cause it really, <laughs> if I can see myself at the surface, I'm happy. Um, okay. But yes, it's, it's, um, it's really interesting the way that you can, uh, I don't want to say trick the eye, but create the illusion that there is much more natural light in a space uh, than in reality. And um, challenges like that happen everywhere. Um, there's no ideal situation, even, even, um, even spaces with too much natural light present their, um, challenges, uh, present their own challenges because they can feel very cold and very, um, they can lack intimacy. So they're not, you know, it, it ain't all cracked up to be what, uh, having all glass. Let me just yeah, put it that yeah, way. Yeah. <laughs> In this, in this next scheme, which is our last scheme. Uh, no, well, here you have a completely windowless scheme. You, it's like you, <laughs> you knew what you were building towards. <laughs> so, so in this next scheme now, it, it, it's that balance of light and dark. Um, you know, you've got the, the heavy stone features and then highlight them with these uh, yeah, accents and, uh, is that a Lalique sink in, the, in it, that image? It is a Lalique sink. If I tell you this, this is a five by five bathroom that has more materials than a, than a 5,000 square foot home could have. I mean, we have ceruse, high gloss, silvered black oak. We have incredible black stone. We have glass walls, plaster walls, metallic ceilings, all in one five by five space. And then we have these Beautiful Lalique examples of Lalique, such as the sconces on the walls and the sink, and even the faucets themselves are made with Lalique crystal. And what's so special about Lalique is it doesn't have that glossy sparkle that you see in other crystals. Instead, it's the matte quality of Lalique in many ways captures the light and then exudes the light. It glows. It has this just this wonderful ethereal warmth to it, which I find is very um, alluring. Yes, yeah, so, and in this case, we have we have both uh, glass pieces, collectible pieces, vases, um, the 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 lovebirds with the flower frogs. Uh, but we all we we have these same sconces available in the sale. Uh, Go get them. Trust me, the, uh, the reserve the, is a good price. So I, I believe it's called they're called the palm uh, with the palm frond design. 
Um, and we also have some other lighting as well. The, you know, the classic uh, sh sh um, maple leaf design uh, with the sconces and the, the chandeliers. And then, and then you, we pair them in, in this uh, scheme with a Paul Evans uh, deep relief cabinet. You know, it, I, I it think is. people would be shocked to, to see uh, Paul Evans and Lalique paired together. But it I works know, you great. Don't, you don't think brutal and delicate all in one sentence. Yeah, but, you know, yeah. There's, yeah it's great. In, in the brutality of Paul Evans, there's actually just a intense sophistication, which I think marries well with Lalique. Um, I mean, I can use these two these two designers in one sentence without any issue. I think they really do work well together. Yep. Yeah. And this this particular sideboard is um, it, 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 just a great piece. Uh, it's that fine line between studio furniture and a piece of art. In this case, it, it you know it's it's hand welded, um, hand riveted with uh, with the slate top and the inserts, um, really just a spectacular piece. My, tra you know, my transportation guys weren't too happy when they had to go pick it up, but you know. You know, the, they, I'm sure they learned quite a bit about uh, craftsmanship just by trying to pack that up. Mm -hmm. But you know, you talk about that, that line between studio pieces and works of art, and why can't your home be a work of art? Um, that's the way I approach my projects and my clients think I'm completely uh, crazy when I say that we're creating works of art in their homes. But at the end of the project, they understand exactly that. There's so much intention, so much thought that goes into each and every nook and cranny of a home. And not only from the four walls that surround you, but to the objet and the pieces of furniture that you put into your home. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to spend more money, but it's that careful consideration of what you bring into your home that makes you feel good and makes you feel special. And in this world that we live in right now, who doesn't want to feel special um, as much as possible? <laughs> so I think we're um, coming to our last slide and we can get into some Q and A. Great. I see two questions posted. Um, Be nice, people. <laughs> one of yeah, one of them was being a bit sarcastic, <laughs> but so we'll go to the second one. Uh, <laughs> You'll have to tell me what the other one is afterwards. <laughs> so we have we we have we have a dealer um, who. Um, has been a treasure hunter and a dealer since 1980. He's got, had countless interior designers, used his website to find treasures, et cetera. But he's never actively marketed himself to that market. Um, okay. So his question is, um, you know, how, how can they make uh, very rare collections, artifacts, and unique art more visible to the interior design and the do-it-yourself home decor market? You know, that's a challenge because for me, I use a lot of what I like to call dealers' dealers, the ones that don't necessarily sell di uh, directly to the public, but instead, instead sell to, to dealers um, because we know that they have quality pieces um, that uh, are not readily available on the market. Um, I mean, I think that the internet is a magical thing. It's wonderful. I also think that it's, I can't tell you how often I receive emails from people uh, at my office, uh, totally, you know, not expecting emails. And they send me portfolios of their work yeah. or portfolios of their inventory. And sometimes I feel like I've, you know, uh, won the jackpot. It's an amazing uh, to come across talented artists as well as talented eyes those are those people are, those people are just as much artisans as the people that put things together those people that are able to assemble collections and see the value in pieces that's really important to me because i'm one person and i can't travel to every uh corner of the earth looking for pieces so to know that there are people there who are 
searching for me and searching for other designers is really important. And I have, I have my Rolodex of people that I have really turned to during COVID because um, I have not been able to travel, but I know that what they have in their inventory is quality and that I don't have to worry about buying it sight unseen. I can buy it and bring it to my clients and it will be phenomenal quality. And a lot of those uh, sight unseen vendors that I work with are people that have approached me, uh, you know, on my, on my website. So it sounds like uh, direct outreach um, through websites, um, maybe uh, purchase a directory of uh, interior designers uh, that are working in certain markets, um, markets that match kind of the material that, that you have would be good ideas. Uh, po possibly shows now that things are opening up again. Uh, what are some of the um, more heavily trafficked interior design shows, for instance, that you could recommend? <clears throat> you know, um, there are show there are regional shows everywhere. There's, you know, I mean, here in New York City, uh, before COVID, we had a show every week. But there are other places in smaller towns. For example, I'm a big um, I'm a big um, fan of the Wilton Historical Society uh, up in Connecticut right now. And they have several shows a year, one of which I'm very involved in called Objects of Desire, which brings dealers and collectors to their facility and allows them to display their goods. That's another place where I've met quite a few artisans that are now part of, part of my Rolodex. So okay. yeah, it's a great thing. So our next question is, um, uh, somebody is just starting out in collecting. And they congratulations. Uh, uh, yep. <laughs> Welcome. Um, and they're wondering, um, you know, like where to start. Um, and, and I think um, actually I lost that. I'm going to get it back. Um, so the question is, what should I collect and where are the best antique markets? So I'll, I'll take a crack at the beginning and then okay. and then I'll hand it. I'll let you, I'll, we'll get your take on the answer. So. So my answer, my, my canned answer to anyone that says, what should I collect is you should collect what you love, right? If, if you love an, if you love a particular object or you're, you, you're interested in the history of how a particular industry or art movement began, you can start looking for objects and artists within that movement that you love and then uh, surround yourself or collect those things that, that you truly love. Um, I find people that collect with the idea of, uh, you know, this is going to be my 401k, um, usually are looking for another investment strategy as retirement approaches. Um, so, so that would be my take. It would be um, collect what you love. And uh, depending on where you live, um, you could find um, uh, antique markets, but certainly Brimfield in Massachusetts is gonna be back up and running. Uh, you know, there's literally dozens of fields filled with, uh, filled with dealers. Um, and, then, and then of course there's auction. Um, you know, a, a, um, there, are, there are always uh, value to be found uh, within auctions as long as you uh, do your homework, um, know what kind of comparable sales are going for, um, have some self-control and setting your limits, um, and, then, and, then, and then bid to win. I don't think I could have said it any better. I think the main, main point that I would love to want to say was, um, don't do this as an investment. Do it as something that really speaks to you and that you're truly passionate about because, um, I think that it's most successful when you're passionate about it rather than thinking, uh, thinking that it's going to bring you a, a monetary return. That's, that's what I think is very important. Right. So the next question um, is about the, um, uh, the upcoming sale and it asks about previews. We are uh, conducting previews again in our Marlboro gallery. Um, appointments are required for uh, tomorrow, but uh, we will be having viewings on, mon on Friday, Monday, and Tuesday. No appointment required. 
uh, we ask that you visit between 10 and four and we're still playing it safe with uh, masks in the building. So come on out and visit, talk with us and uh, we'll show you uh, we'll show you the pieces that you're looking for. I'm jealous. I need to find a minute to get up there myself. Oy. Great. Um, so the next question is, what do you collect? We'll let you feel this one first. <laughs> well, um, you, you can start with that, that image behind you, right? That, that seems to be one of your current collecting yes. areas. Yes. So um, in, I, my, my family's from Latin America, from Chile uh, specifically, and I'm a, an avid collector of Latin American contemporary art. And so um, it's gotten to the point that I have to hang things from the ceilings in my apartment because there's not enough space on the walls. Um, but another thing that you'll see to my right is a fractured resin sphere by Pierre Giraudon, who was a French artist from the 1970s. He would take resin spheres and then electrocute them to create these fractured uh, designs inside of them. And to me, talking about light and the way light moves through a space, seeing how light moves through that fractured uh, sphere is just one of the coolest things. And so I've collected him and other French artists from the 1970s that all were part of that fractured resin movement, which is so cool. And of course, I love my ceramics, which I have uh, lots of uh, things from contemporary ceramics to uh, uh, 20th century. An example of contemporary is I was down at the beach in Chile and I found this potter on, on the beach, just sitting there with a card table sell, selling these incredible pieces, almost kind of Picasso influence. And I bought the entire table. <laughs> he, he didn't know what to do with me. He's like, what? I was like, give it all to me. But when you see something and it gives me such joy every morning when I wake up and I see them, um, and I just see how I've now follow him on Instagram, for example, and I see how his work is progressing. And it's so wonderful to see how an artist evolves over time and doesn't just stick to one note, but instead is constantly pushing themselves in another direction. So that's what I love about art. Great, great. Um, I have another question from someone who's been decorating their home uh, it's a 1928 home, trying to keep it true to that era. So kind of the uh, period correct approach to decoration. Um, they tend to be eclectic. Um, for instance, they love that radio. Uh, should focal points be true to the same era, genre, culture, etc.? You know, that's very interesting to me. I, um, to me, I, I incorporate pieces into my into my own interiors and into my clients homes that bring them joy that bring them meaning and those pieces don't necessarily all come from one specific era um, to be honest with you i think that you know bringing you know if you're doing your period home which i think sounds fantastic i i love home restoration there's something very exciting about bringing a home to its former glory and having it speak again but bring some other some pieces from other periods either prior periods or post periods from that house. And they will almost take an artistic or a sculptural effect within that period interior that you recreated. So don't be strict because what you want is to create some dynamic energy in your space so that it's alive for each and every person that comes through your home. Yep. yep. Well, most importantly, it has to be alive for you. So. <laughs> yep. Great. Um... So the next question is, um, how do you suggest starting to collect? Um, personally, um, uh, my first passion, I guess, was the arts and crafts movement with a slant toward uh, the Boston movement. Um, and it was, uh, it was arts and crafts pottery. And from arts and crafts pottery, which is a broad range where you had uh, centers of production in uh, New England and Boston, outside of New York and big, big manufacturers in, um, in, in Ohio, especially around Cincinnati. 
So it, it's a broad category. So from that, my interest narrowed to, to Boston. And then within New England, you can find um, a limited number of potters to collect. Um, so that kind of, you know, narrows it down for you. Um, and then uh, within those within those particular collect areas, you can then start looking for particular potters that you like, decorators that you like, um, but it's really find that thing that you have passion for, that you're able to uh, enjoy the history behind, um, and then you'll find your way into your own collection. I, I think that's very true. And I think you, you referenced Brimfield, for example. Go to a place where it's not just one vendor. Every vendor or every vendor that, ha that sells pieces has a specific perspective on what they're selling. They're passionate about what they're selling. So, they, so to be able to go to a place like Brimfield where you have a hundred vendors with a hundred distinct passions for a hundred different types of things, it really allows you to kind of do your homework and see what makes you tick, what gets you excited. Um, and from there you go down that rabbit hole of collecting um, and you can go to fairs that are more specific about what you love and you can find vendors that have freestanding stores that have what you love um, and website platforms that sell what you love. So, but being able to go and find a place like Brimfield or another art fair that has those perspectives. That's really, really special. Great. So our next or question. Yeah. Our, our next question is uh, for someone that has just embarked on creating collections of furniture and likes the many of the pieces shown today, but cannot afford to buy only these pieces do you have recommendations beyond the big box stores? Similar to the above question, but how would you suggest going about finding these other pieces besides investment pieces? I think that there's a lot of value at auction, um, you know, and there are, and uh, you know, I think that you get a much, and I'm sure every big box store is going to kill me saying this, but you get a really good, you get a really big bang for your buck at an auction and you get pieces with uh, great history. They're, they're pieces that are, are at auction because they've stood the test of time and they have really, um, they have meaning and, um, and they have quality and craftsmanship that you may not necessarily find with pieces that you find on today's market. So have patience play with the auctions, um, study the auction results. Of, if there's a specific piece that you like, they come up to auction quite often, okay? And so see how the market is progressing with the pieces. Are you at, a, at the pinnacle of that piece or are you going down into an, an area where it may not, may not be getting as much as it would normally garner. So you, you just really, you need to have patience uh, because collecting is a beautiful thing and collecting is not an overnight thing. Collecting is a lifetime and um, it gives you something to look forward to every day. And that's what uh, uh, I do vicariously through my clients as I create collections and it gives me something, challenges me because I, there are so many different passions for each and every client that I work with. So revel in it. Don't get stressed out by it. I'm actually glad this question came up because there, there can be a perception that buying at auction involves nothing but high value pieces. And, you know, the truth of the matter is there are roughly 550 lots in this sale. Um, will probably average somewhere between, you know, $1,000 a lot, 1,000 to 1,500, uh, you know, possibly up to $2,000 a lot. So while I've got, you know, the Judy McKee dragon table that I think could push 50,000, there's also uh, pieces in this sale that, you know, that are gonna go for under $500, you know, so, 
um, look at the estimates. Um, you know, if if you're um, uh, if you don't want to shop the high end of the sale, you can sort the sale by estimate value, low to high. Look at the bottom, see what's there. Um, if you're looking for those investment pieces, flip the script, sort from high to low, and you're going to see all those high value um, lots at the top. Um, this feeds kind of into that next question where someone has a limited budget under 5,000, uh, what can I get? Again, uh, peruse the sale. Uh, you say that um, you know, you're into uh, 19th century glass. Um, that won't be my, you won't find any of that in this sale. You'll find some early uh, 20th century, the galley pieces and um, you know, some of the French cameo glass, those are all, um, you know, in the 1890 to 1920 range. Um, you also say that you're interested in Italian blown glass, and there is a great collection of mid-century uh, Murano glass in, in this sale. So I would expect those pieces are going to go in the you know, 500 to $2,500 range, depending on the piece and the artist. So, um, you know, it's not all um, uh, five, 10, 20, $50,000 lots at auction. Uh, there's a lot of material that's affordable. <coughs> we, we also have here at Skinner, a monthly uh, interiors online sale. So these are pieces that um, may not make our, our major sales, um, either because they're under a value threshold or uh, they might need some work. Um, so if, if, uh, if, if you're able to uh, refinish furniture yourself, uh, there's some project pieces to be had. Um, we all need a little work every once in a while, so. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, this is true. So, so I think um, shop the sales, don't be intimidated um, and, and don't, um, uh, you know, the only thing you hear about on the news are the things that sell for $2 million at auction. Not everything sells for $2 million <laughs> at auction. So, um, you know, feel free to shop. Oh, you'd, you'd be surprised. Sometimes the most expensive pieces are not the ones that speak to you. It could oftentimes be the middle to lower range. So yep. you just never know. You just need to hunger down and try it out. So this next question um, is advice on restoring a piece of art, furniture, etc. How do you go about finding a restorer? Uh, <clears throat> I'm a big nerd. I like to research uh, my restorers. I um, like to go to their studios and see the things that they're working on um, to see if they are um, speaking my language. I can't tell you how many times clients of mine have gone and had something restored abominably. Um, mm -hmm. And it just breaks my heart because uh, it's not that they were trying to cut corners necessarily, but they just didn't have the right person doing it. Um, I also rely on antiques vendors that I know that specialize in specific areas of uh, furniture. Um, and if I have a piece of furniture from that area, I'll say, who would you recommend for this piece? Because uh, there are people that can restore English continental furniture. There are people that can restore American furniture but they might not be able to restore art deco furniture because the process of finishing is so different. So you can't just take everything to one place. I wish it were that easy, but it's far from the, tr far from being the case. And also um, auction houses, Dan, I hope I'm not throwing you under the bus, but auction houses always have people that they know um, local and, and nationally, and maybe even internationally that they can recommend. Um, to, uh, we, to help. Yep. So we have um, we we have one or two certainly on the uh, wood furniture side, and I have one local leather worker that we could recommend. Um, uh, these guys um, typically you need to get in touch with them fairly early because the good restorers usually have a backlog. 
um, that's just the way it is. But I would go to your local, hit your local antique shops um, and ask them who they use. Sometimes it's treated like a trade secret. You might not be able to get it out of them. Um, But certainly um, all the furniture that went into that shop most likely did not look like it does now when it was acquired. Um, So it's very true. Um, If you see a diamond in a rough that has potential, do your homework on it to see if there's a, you know, a story about it because uh, restoring it may, the cost might seem high, but if you think about the value that it will accrue by that restoration, um, it could be very profitable to do that. And um, there are lots of diamonds in the rough in this yep. world. So. But even like, you know, Nakashima furniture, um, uh, his daughter Mira has carried on the tradition. Um, I would not recommend you take a piece of Nakashima furniture to anyone but Mira to be restored. Yes. Uh, I think we're done with that one. Oh, last question. Uh, so if anyone else out there is sitting on a question that they don't want to ask, you know, the old adage, there are no bad questions. So um, feel free to submit some. Um, so we'll let you answer this one first and, and, uh, and then I'll go. So uh, what museum has the best collections to learn from and what are your favorites? You know, I think that every museum has its strengths and weaknesses. So I could, but I will say that I absolutely adore the Metropolitan Museum of Art here in New York for the, the English wing or the British wing, whatever they call it is spectacular. Even the American wing, they have rooms with just vitrines filled with different periods of American furniture, which I think is so wonderful. And then there are places like um, the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, um, which I could get lost there for days. They have a whole section on China um, and it's almost dizzying. You have to take breaks in between the, the, the viewings because there's just so much to see. Um, it really, you know, yep, and yeah, it goes I, back I'm, to my, sorry. No, yeah, we're, I'm, I'm, I'm similar, right? For, for me, it's the, uh, the MFA in Boston, um, has a great arts and arts and crafts collection, um, and beyond, right? Um, it's certainly a top tier institution. Um, my, my, um, Working here actually has exposed me to a lot of American craft, and um, that's kind of where my tastes are starting to head. And um, I, I, the Museum of Art and Design in, in, in New York is fabulous. But it goes back to my point about, you know, when you're starting to figure out how to collect, don't just go to one museum because you're right. seeing uh, every museum has its strengths and its weaknesses. And that's not saying anything against uh, any museums, but they are, they pride themselves in specific collections. So exhaust the museums, go from the ones that have more traditional pieces to pieces that are more contemporary. There are even museums that are displaying things that are currently being made, but they see that in person that, you know, that impressive quality and craftsmanship. So you might just think that you're going to be a collector of traditional pieces and end up being a collector of contemporary, you know, you just never know. And, and, and if you find an artist that you like and they're still producing, um, you know, don't underestimate gallery exhibitions. You know, you can, um, you can learn directly from the artists in many cases at, at, in that kind of environment. And, you know, let me say this, I, speaking about contemporary artists, I am just finishing a project here in New York where we used a very, we rescued a beautiful piece of art from the uh, plaster art from the 1970s and we needed to make it fit into this new interior and I just literally emailed the info account for the artist and the artist responded back to me and we've become friends now Um, (laughs) artists crave in many instances they crave that personal connection with people because they get inspired and they they produce and go in different directions by listening and having a dialogue with others. So you'd be surprised that they are approachable. Um, and so don't be afraid. Yep. All right, so, so we'll wrap up. That was the last question. 
Um, I'll share the question that we dismissed. It, it must have came up after the um, uh, the slide with the magazine rack, and the question was, "What is a magazine?" So. <laughs> <laughs> I actually like that. I'm a, I'm still the person that has to. I like to feel my the paper in my hands as I look at a magazine. So, uh, yes, there's only so much that digital can do for me. But I love them both. Okay. So in closing, again, as always, thank you, Philip. Uh, this has been an informative discussion. Always wonderful to gain insight into your process and to have the opportunity to provide some background on the objects in the sale and the auction process. Uh, I wanna thank our audience for joining us today. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can email uh, any questions about the talk, items in the sale, questions about buying at auction, feel free to email us at uh, 20th century at skinnerinc.com um, and we'll get right back to you. And please visit Philip's website at philipthomasinc.com and you can see some of the innovative and stunning interiors that uh, he's designed and some of which he shared with us today. And if you have any questions, you can email my info at philipthomasinc.com. I'm always answering questions, so it would be my pleasure. All right. Great. Thank you all. Thank you, Skinner. Thank you, Philip.